Tale of the Manticore. Bonus episode. Welcome to Mail of the Manticore. According to lore, a manticore occasionally gets questions in their mailbox. There will be much answering in the days ahead. Hey, this is John, creator of Tale of the Manticore. I'd like to thank you for all of your great questions over the last few months. I've selected a dozen of them and I've made a mailbag episode. Let's dive in. The first question comes from Robin Sampson. Robin asks, How do you decide to structure and pace your episodes? Do you play through a couple of hours worth and then divide into suitable cliffhangers? If so, do you have to go back and fix the pacing so that each episode is roughly the same length? Thanks so much for your question, Robin. It's a great question. I'll answer the last part first. I don't go back and fix anything, but I do carefully select an endpoint. Uh, usually when I'm playing the game and kind of typing the script as I go, that happens simultaneously. Uh, I keep an eye on the time, and I guess I've been doing this long enough that I kind of just know how long um, a single page will be. Typically a page of script uh, will last for a minute and a half. It varies, but that's a kind of rule of thumb. So when I get to about page 16 or 17, then I start thinking about what would be a good place to end off. Um, if I can find a natural place for a cliffhanger, then I'll definitely go for that. If I can't do that, maybe I'll just try and end on a strong beat. One thing I really dislike doing is ending in the middle of combat. However, I have had to do that a couple of times and there's just been no way around it. In terms of how I decide to structure and pace the episodes, well, I guess there's a few things going on there too. I'll try and keep segments fairly short, um, three to five minutes usually, just to kind of keep the tempo up. Uh, and I'll try to um, space them out. And so it's not all just story. Actually, there's um, some uh, sort of meta gaming uh, going on to divide it up or to break it up. I can vary it even more by using a dramatis personae to do a flashback or to give some character insights. And then very occasionally I'll use a between the lines section, which I guess has kind of become a meta meta section. So I'm not talking about the rules as they apply to a certain situation, but uh, maybe it rules in the general or world building or something like that. Finally, to answer your question about how long I'll play in a given time, uh, it really varies, but usually not that long. Uh, usually I'll play for half an hour, and then I'll spend maybe the next 24 hours with some part of my brain just going over what might happen next. I have settled into a kind of routine with it, but it's not always the same. Question number two. This one comes from Angry Piper. He asks, how did you get into gaming and what were your first games? Well, this is something I can answer pretty quickly. I'm pretty sure I was 10 years old, maybe 11, when I got into uh, gaming and it was through my brother who had a set of basic rules. It's the uh, Purple Moldve edition boxed set for D&D. I was instantly hooked, absolutely hooked. And I suspect I've been chasing that dragon and trying to regain that high uh, ever since. Some of the other things that I was really into as a kid uh, after discovering D&D were the fighting fantasy books, uh, Villains and Vigilantes, Top Secret, Star Frontiers, Gamma World, a game that maybe a few of you have heard of called Toon. It was a weird one. Eventually I got into AD&D and then Second Edition, and really that's what I played mostly as a teenager. Uh, when I was about 18 years old, I gave up the hobby completely, and I didn't come back to it until a year and a half ago. Thanks very much for that question, Angry Piper. The next one is from Talon Waite. Talon writes, I'm trying to incorporate your house rules you mentioned into my own game. Do you happen to have them written down? Yes and no, Talon. I do, but it's not published anywhere. Uh, there's some stuff on the blog, but not all of it. It's incomplete. You know, I experimented with Evernote for a little while, but uh, eventually I gave that up. And at the end of the day, I just throw everything into a single document. I've called it Encyclopedia Manticorica. And I actually plan to publish that after Season 1. 
It's got all of my charts, timelines, language notes, so I can be consistent with language. Uh, it's even got a calendar so that I can quickly find out, you know, um, how many days ago a certain event happened if I want to refer to that in the show. Anyway, I'll be publishing that, but probably not until summer of 2022. Question number four. This is one more from Talon. I know at the beginning the characters had a luck score. Then around episode five or six, you either did an interlude or a blog post about it being a useless stat, as you never used it. I'm curious, did you ever decide to use it, or do you end up using any type of meta currency? That's a good question, Talon. So, because Tale of the Manticore really is an experiment uh, in fiction without a lot of models for me to follow, I kind of had to test things in show. Uh, so it was inevitable that some things failed and the luck score was one of those things. Speaking of luck, I think I've been pretty lucky in that a lot of my decisions, like uh, how often to level up, for example, have worked out quite well, despite having started out as a best guess. Did I ever use that luck score? I think I used it one time. The idea behind it was kind of the way it works in Call of Cthulhu. Uh, that was my idea anyway. I really thought that I would use it all the time, but I, I just didn't. <laughs> I don't know, I just didn't. In terms of meta currency, no. I, uh, I haven't. I like those mechanics, but I, I guess it just never came up. Okay, this fifth question is from Anonymous, because actually I've received this question from a lot of different people. The question is, what's the process for contributing a voice? Easier than you might think, Anonymous. Uh, it's really, I have a three point plus one wish list. Here are the points. One, the contributor be a fan of the show. Two, the contributor has the right accent. And three, they have a decent microphone. And I value those qualities in that order. So if I can get two out of three, I'm usually happy. If a person doesn't have a good mic, but they have a phone, that's fine by me if they're a fan of the show and their accent is right. The plus one, by the way, is sometimes people turn out to be a really good actor. So that's always a bonus. Question six through eight, who ended up doing a voice for the show? He plays Garrett Magger the proprietor of the Dead Troll Tavern in Thangar. All right, Hodag RPG asks, where did you get inspired for your dwarven culture? That's, hmm, that's a tough one. There's something vaguely Scandinavian, I guess, Scandinavian adjacent uh, in some of the words that I was choosing, uh, but I've also worked in some uh, Japanese and um, a bunch of Easter egg words that are either something from classic D&D spelled backwards or an anagram of something like that. And then a huge helping of just nonsense syllables strung together in a way that I feel sounds pleasing. You know, it's hard to really give a good answer to this, but I, I suppose the way it fell out is once I'd assembled a dozen words or names uh, with any of those methods I just described, everything else just kind of needed to sound a bit like that. And if it did, then I used it. Uh, I make heavy use of my phone's memo pad app. And as I'm walking and commuting and whatever, uh, if a name kind of just pops into my head, as very often happens, uh, I have a memo which is just for names. And, and I've organized it by culture, so I'll, I'll just slot it into the appropriate culture given the sound. One last thing for dwarves specifically is I try to usually give them a family name that reflects a job. I say usually, but maybe half the time. All right, thanks for that great question, Hodeg RPG. I see that I've already started to answer your second question, which is, where do you derive names for your characters? Uh, I'll just add one more thing, because it's kind of funny. Um, because I do a lot of random syllables mashed together, I guess it's not surprising that eventually I would come close to um, landing on a name that already exists. And so the name Umura just popped into my head one day. And of course, this was very early on in the story because Umura is an original character uh, and has been there from the very beginning. When I came back to role playing, um, I had never played 5e. In fact, I've still never played 5e because I want to do it with a live group and well, you know, pandemic, blah, blah, blah. Eventually I got my hands on a player's handbook and I was reading through it a little bit when I came across the name of a sample character, and it was Umara. And I thought, oh my god, what are the chances? People are going to think I ripped off the player's freaking handbook. Well, I've got a third question from Hodag RPG here too. His last question is, 
how do you intuit non-dice roll story elements, and were the characters saved by a dice roll uh, when they were starving outside Thangar, or was the Dwarven Patrol pretty much guaranteed to find them? That was a kind of a special case, Hodag RPG. Uh, so I had done the math, so to speak, and kind of counted up their days without food, and I realized that they would just, just squeak by. And so my original idea was to have them showing up in Thangar, you know, starving, dying of thirst, and kind of collapse on the doorstep. But as so often happens, my uh, second and third and fourth ideas are usually better than my first. And I thought, you know, I can make this more interesting while still keeping the integrity of the game itself. So nobody survived that should have died, and at no point was there a TPK. I just thought it would be more dramatic if I if I dangled a bit of suspense there and then had them discovered by a scouting party from Thangar. So that's how that happened. Uh, that, that kind of thing's pretty rare, but I feel like as long as I'm true to my own rules, that kind of thing is okay now and then. The next few questions come from Jason Stein. Jason's first question is, how long on average does an episode take now between the dice rolling and the long walks you must take when something unexpected occurs, uh, like a nat 20 on a stumble upon, for example, recording, editing, uploading on YouTube, posting on the website, etc. And also has the time decreased to produce an episode as I've gone along. Jason, it definitely has gotten faster. I've gotten more efficient and I've learned a few tricks, such as editing as I go to catch mistakes and correct them as they happen, uh, instead of having to plug things in later, which can cause problems. To answer your question, I would say it's about 20 hours an episode. Maybe occasionally I can get away with 15. Uh, that definitely doesn't include things like thinking about it, because that's basically constant for me. It sounds like a lot of work, but um, my point of view is that it's a lot of play. There are very, very few parts of the process that I don't enjoy. We might touch on that a little bit later, though. Let's see. Jason's second question is, you're incredibly consistent in putting out content, yet there's no Patreon or financial incentive that I'm aware of besides the Rules Light RPG. What is your why that drives you to continue to put out this content on a regular basis and for so long? Do you ever see yourself accepting donations via Patreon or other platforms? I have no problem with Patreon, Ko-fi, tip jars, or any of those things. I think for a lot of people, those are a really good way to kind of keep the lights on. But when I started this project, uh, my goal was never to make money. Um, there's many easier ways to make money than starting a podcast. Uh, and so my expectation was that I would actually take a little bit of a loss and that that would be fine because it's something that I enjoy doing and like any other hobby, I would expect it to cost a little bit. The reason I put out the Rules Light RPG was, well, mostly just because the idea occurred to me and I thought I would put it out. Being able to cross-promote it with my podcast is helpful, I think. And... I would have put it out for free, except that I think that there might be a kind of psychological effect with free material that it's not very good or it's disposable, and so I just put a token amount on it. Now, will I ever start a Patreon? Well, never say never is certainly not for the duration of season one. Um, making money is just simply not my goal. Uh, I'm doing this 100% because I adore D&D &D and I want it back in my life and this is a way to do that. And really, that that's the whole answer. Let's see. Jason's third and last question. Is there an end goal in mind? How will you know when and if the podcast should come to an end? By now in this story, there is an end goal. There really is a final quest from where I am in the game. It has already begun, but I'm, I'm usually playing seven or eight episodes ahead of publication dates. So in terms of what's being published so far, you can probably guess what is coming. We're entering that final high-level module, so to speak, and uh, not every loose end is gonna be tied up. Again, it's not a novel, it's a game, and so some threads will be left hanging, but the main threads will get tied into a bow, one way or another. I think somewhere around episode 80, unless things zag in a way that I completely haven't anticipated, which of course can happen. Thanks for those great questions, Jason Stein. Well, here we are at our final question, the 12th of the dozen. I saved this one for last because this one does contain a spoiler for episode 33, so if you have not yet listened as far as episode 33 and somehow you've found yourself listening to this episode now, uh, you should stop and um, wait until you've caught up a little bit before listening to uh, the remainder of this mailbag episode. 
This last question is from Jamie Prentice. Jamie asks, The sisters were punished by their goddess for an act of cannibalism, but it seems harsh that their goddess would expect them to just starve slowly. There were clearly mitigating circumstances. Will the sisters ever be able to find peace in the afterlife? Now that is a great question. Thanks for that, Jamie. I think there's a couple of ways to answer this. The easy answer is that the gods are mysterious, and they are demanding, and they are jealous. But the real answer is this. Hanavi is the goddess of hope, and so when the sisters committed this act of cannibalism, they had essentially abandoned their hope, and therefore abandoned their goddess. And that is why they were punished so severely. It wasn't for the blasphemy of cannibalism, it was for giving up on their goddess. And so, could the sisters ever find peace in the afterlife? Uh, not likely. To everyone that sent in a question, thank you so much. If I didn't get to your question, who knows, maybe there will be another mailbag down the line, or I may answer some of these questions on my blog. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to everybody for listening and for telling your friends about the show, for posting on Reddit, for tweeting about the show. All of this stuff really helps, and the show has really been growing and growing. It's already surpassed my hopes. Maybe Hanavi is smiling on me. Anybody listening to this right now, you've got my gratitude for listening to the show, for sticking through those early episodes that, you know, were a little bit, uh, well, we'll call them a learning experience. Um, it's exciting for me to uh, get email from people who like the show, to read the reviews, and just to see the audience growing and growing. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. And we will see you in 2022. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs>